Hi folks, Mr. Ackerman here. Thanks for watching. The topic of this video is Forces in Uniform Circular Motion. It is part two of the video uh, set for this section. What we're going to be talking about today are the fictitious forces that arrive when you are in a rotating frame of reference. If you think about what we've already discussed, which was in part one of the video, we talked about uniform circular motion and the forces that cause uniform circular motion, but we, if whether you realized it or not, we didn't talk about the forces that you feel if you are in the frame of reference. In other words, what we were doing was discussing the forces that we see from the Earth's inertial frame of reference. And to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, I'm going to go to the next slide very shortly. First, I just want you to pause the video, take a look at where we are in the unit schedule, as well as the learning goals and success criteria, and what we're going to be talking about for today. So pause the video now and do that. Okay, and you're back, and I would like to move on by giving you an idea of what we mean by these uh, fictitious forces in rotating frames of reference. Here's a series of pictures. You're familiar with at least one of these. It's the driving in the car picture. The other three maybe you're familiar with, maybe you're not. So let's start with the one that everyone's familiar with. I want you to consider this driver who's going in a circle. The circle could be described as a right turn for the driver. Uh, you could also describe it as a clockwise circle when viewed from above. So if we were watching this from above, you can see the drivers making this kind of turn. I would call that clockwise viewed from above. All right, let's take a look at the forces that are acting on this driver. Uh, for one thing, there is a normal force as a result of him or her sitting in a seat. And of course, there is gravity acting on the driver. What other forces act on the driver? Well, first of all, the driver's making a circle that we discussed, the center of which is over here. So you and I both know that there's got to be some force pointing inward toward the center. After all, uniform circular motion has center-seeking forces. But what force is this? Well, think to yourself what it feels like when you are in a car that is making a turn. You start making a turn, and your body feels itself pushed to the outside of the turn. I hope you can realize that this driver will feel himself flung outward. In fact, we could even put a force vector going this way. What would its name be? Well, that's another question mark that hopefully we're going to answer shortly. We have two forces here that we so far have to think about. Well, let's talk about the one that at least we have already discussed by talking about circular motion in the previous video. The driver gets flung outward toward the side, and if the turn is sharp enough, his body is going to bump up against the door, the side of the door there. Now the door then pushes the driver inward, a reaction force, and what do we call this? Well, this is actually a normal force. I'm going to replace that question mark with an N. The door is a surface. It does push the driver, and so this you could describe as the normal force due to the door, not to be confused with the normal force because he's sitting on the seat. Okay, uh, that leaves us with this question of if you are the driver and you feel yourself thrown outward toward the, uh, toward the door, what force is that? Is it a normal force? No. Is it a gravity force? Certainly not. Is it a friction force? Is it a tension force? Is it an electromagnetic force or a nuclear force? If you think about this, the force that throws you to the outside of a turn is actually none that we can account for. In fact, we have a name for this kind of force. It's called a fictitious force, and of course we discussed these back at the end of chapter 2 when we dealt with fictitious forces in straight line acceleration situations. Now we're just going to be talking about them in rotating situations. Maybe you've heard the specific name for this kind of fictitious force which arises when we're moving in a circle. It's called the centrifugal force. And now maybe you can think back to when we started talking about uniform circular motion and we mentioned the word centripetal. I bet you there were some of you who thought, doesn't he mean centrifugal? The answer was no. Centripetal, as I mentioned earlier, means pointing toward the center. Some force is responsible for pointing toward the center and causing the circular motion. In this case, it's the normal force exerted by the door onto the driver. However, that's in the earth frame of reference. In the car frame of reference, where you feel yourself flung outward 
as we've all experienced if we've ever been in a car making a turn. That one is called the centrifugal force. And I'd like you to, uh, to note right now that the acceleration direction, of course, is inward toward the center. We have a name for this. We call it centripetal acceleration. And the rule that we learned way back when we talked about fictitious forces for the first time, which was that fictitious forces point opposite the acceleration, well, guess what? That rule still holds. The fictitious force for someone going in a circle in a car points outward away from the center. The centripetal acceleration points inward toward the center. So there's really nothing new to learn here. We're just applying what we know about fictitious forces to rotating frames of reference. Now let's talk about these three remaining pictures here. One of them that I bet um, a lot of you have experienced, this one over here, is the ride at Wonderland that's called Nightmares. You get on it, you stand in a cage like this with uh, three other people, they lock the doors, you're standing up, the, the ride begins spinning, it begins rotating, and you feel yourself flung outward away from the center of the circle. You almost feel yourself getting pressed up against the walls of the cage that you're in. And this is a neat feeling, and as a result, they start raising this wheel here. Pretty soon you're making a vertical circle, and you're afraid you're going to fall flat on your face, but you don't. It's spinning fast enough that that outward centrifugal force keeps you pinned to the wall. Of course, what is the inward force that's causing you to go in a circle? Once again, just like the driver in the car, it's a normal force, not due to the door here, but due to the wall at the back of the cage. Gravity also acts, and so this is kind of a tricky situation because you're not making a horizontal circle like a driver. However, it does serve to illustrate the purpose of a centrifugal force. Here's two others. Uh, I think some of you will be familiar with this, especially if you're interested in biology and physics. This is a biophysics picture where a researcher in a, I'm going to guess, a biology lab is placing a test tube into some device that spins very, very fast. It's called a centrifuge, and I'm sure now you can see where that word comes from. It comes from centrifugal. These devices spin, and they take the sample that might be in the test tube, for example, it could be blood from a patient, and it separates it into its various components, the cellular components and whatnot, so that it can then be studied. Uh, your washing machine works on a similar principle. If you ever go wash your clothes, they're soaking wet at the end of the wash cycle. The washing machine then spins them, and there are little holes in the wall of the washing machine, and the water escapes through those holes, and the, the, the clothes at the end of the spin cycle come out relatively dry. You can then throw them in the dryer, and with a bit of heat and uh, blowing air, they will dry. The final picture here is, uh, it might be hard to see. By the way, these two pictures, this one and this one, are out of your textbook. It's Physics 12 by Nelson, to give credit where credit is due. Uh, this picture here has an astronaut being trained for space travel by being spun in a circle by this machine. And what they're trying to do here is apply what we've uh, already discussed in a previous video called G's. If you remember that, part one of this video where we talked about the G-force on a pilot, they're trying to apply that uh, in order to train the astronaut to go into space and experience these forces. And of course, if you look back in the previous video, you'll see how G's were applied on a fighter pilot or a passenger in a fighter aircraft. Same idea in this machine, this one for training purposes. All right, so now that you have a, an intuitive feel about what we mean by these fictitious forces in a rotating frame of reference, we'll go to our next slide and do a little bit closer analysis on the one that we were talking about back here with the driver. Okay. So take a look at these free body diagrams. We're now going to compare what happens in the Earth frame of reference with what happens in the car frame of reference, just to help, uh, you, help you get that idea down before we go and solve problems. Here we've got a, a bird's eye view of a driver making this time a counterclockwise circle. So that is a slightly different view than what you saw in this picture here. This is a video, this is a picture rather, that you might see if you were standing up near the side of the road watching this car go by. I'm going to call that a street level view as opposed to a bird's eye view. So let's go back here. In the bird's eye view, the instantaneous velocity vector, of course, is tangent to the path. They're showing you that. Here's the door and there's the passenger. There's some force pointing inward toward the center 
which provides the centripetal acceleration. And as we discussed, it's the force of the door on the passenger. The free body diagram, however, is drawn from street level. For example, if you were standing on the street watching this car go by, this is what you would see. You'd see a vertical normal force pointing straight up. You'd see gravity pointing straight down. The normal force, of course, would act inward toward the center. However, what would the free body diagram look like <clears throat> in the car's frame of reference? Well, now, once again, a bird's eye view. So this time we have, again, the normal force uh, of the door on the passenger, but an outward centrifugal force, the fictitious force, acting on the passenger. And of course, if you're in a car and you feel yourself mashed against the door during a sharp turn, within the car's frame of reference, you are not accelerating. You are stuck against the wall of, or the wall of the door, rather, the side of the car. You would say that the normal force and the fictitious force are in balance. So remember, there is no acceleration seen in the frame of reference of the car, but there is acceleration seen when you are viewing from without, from the outside of this frame of reference. The free body diagram from street level, of course, is shown here again, similar to the free body diagram in the earth frame of reference, but this time including the fictitious force. Same rules that you used for drawing free body diagrams in the end of the last chapter when we talked about straight line or linear acceleration. All right, so hopefully you can see how the free body diagrams look in both frames of reference, and you can also see how to view from different points of view, bird's eye views and street level views. It's gonna be important for seeing what's going on in real life situations. We move on. Right now, I'd like you to, uh, in a moment, pause this video and watch Frames of Reference Parts 3 and 4. These are in the homework schedule right at the beginning here, so you're going to click on these number 3 and 4, and that will bring you to YouTube, which should get you to this, Frames of Reference Part 3, and this Frames of Reference Part 4. They're each about 4 or 5 minutes, so pause my video now, go to these for approximately 10 minutes, to hear a little bit more from those U of T professors in their classic video. Okay, and you're back, and uh, I'd like to uh, bring your attention to what uh, is going to be the fact of the video. I guess I could have mentioned this to you previously before uh, I told you to go watch the video. However, what was the fact that I wanted you to learn? And yeah, there's going to be a quiz on this, and nope, don't tell your friends what it is. Make them watch the video too. That's the purpose of this little exercise. The fact of the video is about Earth's centripetal acceleration at the equator. If you recall in the video, one of the professors mentioned that the Earth is spinning. Now, if you know a little bit about Earth, you know we don't spin perfectly upright the way someone who might be spinning a basketball on uh, his or her hand stands. So what would that look like? That would look something like this. You know, you see people, I don't know how they do it, but they spin a basketball on their, on their finger like that. And there's the spin axis, pretty vertical. Well, the Earth is a little bit different. Its axis is actually tilted for reasons I'm not going to discuss right now, but you could look into them if you wanted to. It deals with some interesting astronomy. Uh, the Earth has a radius of 6,380 kilometers. And don't forget, as usual, we've got to convert that into meters. So that would be times 1,000 would give you this many meters. Of course, every member of this planet knows that the rotation period is 24 hours, and that comes out to 86,400 seconds. So what they do in the video is they tell you what the Earth's centripetal acceleration is if you are standing on the equator going in a circle. And we can calculate that. The formula involving period would be 4 pi squared r over t squared. And without me subbing these in, I'll leave that for you to do you're going to come up with 0.03 of a meter per second squared. Now, we know that if we drop an object toward uh, and let it fall to the ground, no matter where you are on the surface of the Earth, down would be toward the center. And when you're standing at the equator, that, of course, goes opposite the centrifugal force, which is pointing outward due to the fact that you are in a rotating frame of reference. So think about this for a minute. 
In the Earth frame of reference, there's a downward acceleration of 9.80 meters per second squared, but there's an outward centrifugal acceleration of 0.03 meters per second squared. The centrifugal acceleration is exactly equal to the centripetal acceleration, but it goes opposite the acceleration and it's only in the Earth's frame of reference. Therefore, we can expect to see objects fall at this rate if we are in the Earth frame of reference. Now, is this something that you would ever notice in a high school classroom? Probably not. There are many sources of error in a falling object experiment that would, would probably mask the slight difference. However, it does exist. And an even more interesting thing is that if you are at the North Pole, at the polar region of the Earth, as opposed to the equator, which would be around here, think about this for a minute. Because the circle you're making is very tiny when you're at the pole, in fact, if you're right at the pole, you're not even really spinning in a circle of radius with any value, the radius would be zero. Therefore, the centripetal acceleration is actually zero at the poles, while it's 0 0.03 at the equator, meaning that this effect that we've talked about only exists at the equator, and it diminishes as you head toward the polar region, which is kind of an interesting fact. But what do you need to know for the quiz in class? These numbers here about being at the equator. Okay, and I'm going to finish up with one question from your book. I'm not going to do all of this for you. I'm just going to help you to interpret it so that maybe you can give it a shot. And in class, we will talk more about it. These two questions in your textbook in section 3.2 do go together. So let's read them together. In 12, you're standing on a slowly rotating merry-go-round, turning counterclockwise as viewed from above. All good physics students begin drawing diagrams when they are solving a problem. So the first thing you can draw is a circle rotating counterclockwise as viewed from above. So you should have this kind of diagram here. There's the center of the circle, merry-go-round. They ask you to draw a free body diagram for your body in the Earth's frame of reference and in the frame of reference of the merry-go-round. Now I'm going to leave that to you. I'm going to give you a hint though. This is very, very similar to the question that we did here, where instead of being in a, in a merry-go-round, you're in a car. And in fact, this is going counterclockwise just like the merry-go-round question. So without looking at this and sort of copying, see if you can figure out what the forces would look like on a free body diagram in the Earth and in the merry-go-round frame of reference. One thing to keep in mind, however, in the car example that we did back here, it was the door that you were pressed up against that moved you in a circle. That's a normal force. If you're in a merry-go-round, you're probably not pressed up against a door uh, think about what you do. You either sit down on one of the horses, or more likely if you're older, uh, maybe you're a parent or you're taking your little brother or sister or a, a niece or nephew or a cousin on the ride, you're probably standing up. And so I'm going to ask you to think really about what would be the inward centripetal force acting on you. Would it be a normal force or might it be something else? So think about that. Think about what force points inward. And of course, don't forget, in the MGR, merry-go-round FOR, frame of reference, you have to make sure that you include the centrifugal force. Okay, And uh, in the Earth frame of reference, of course, you are not going to include the centrifugal force. Okay, and now that hopefully you've had a chance to draw this and compare with what you had with the car over here, now let's do part, uh, the second part of this question, question 13. It says, when you stand on the merry-go-round in question 12, you hold a string from which is suspended a rubber stopper. Here go those physicists again hanging rubber stoppers from masses. Again, this is going to act as a gauge of our acceleration, just like it did when we talked about accelerating in a straight line and hanging a mass from a rubber stopper from a, a string, how it swings at an angle and causes, um, allows us to measure the centripetal, sorry, not the centripetal, but rather the acceleration of the object. So think about this for a moment. 
You are 2.9 meters from the center, so we're going to put that in here as our radius. And you are taking 4.1 seconds to complete a revolution. That is a period, letter T. And they ask you to draw a diagram showing the situation at the instant you are moving due east. Now they don't tell you what direction is what here, so as far as I'm concerned, you're free to say this is north and that is east. So if you're going around in this circle, when are you moving east? Well, just following the cursor, you can see you're going east now. Right at this point down here is when you are going east. Sorry, that's not a very good tangent line, but there we go. Here's your instantaneous velocity. This does not belong on a free body diagram. It's a velocity, not a force. However, when you are going east, it looks like you're down here at the south end of the merry-go-round. So that's something to keep in mind. We're trying to visualize the problem here. Draw a free body diagram of a rubber stopper that you have suspended from a string. So now I want you to think about this. Pause the video if you have to. You're on a merry-go-round and you're spinning around here. In fact, what you should do is pause the video and get up and hold something from a string. Maybe take your shoes off and dangle them from the shoelaces. Spin yourself in a circle and when you are right around this point here, moving this way, ask yourself what direction are the shoes that are hanging? Uh, what, what angle are they making with the vertical? I think what you'll notice is that if you are doing this, the shoes swing outward. And so you might sort of draw this. You might imagine that there is some force acting on the shoes and it is pointing outward. This is the centrifugal force. However, if we look at this from above in what's called a bird's eye view, which is what I'm showing you right now, it's going to be very hard, hard to see what is going on. So just like in the car example, we did a bird's eye view and then we did a street level view. I'm now going to do a street level view of what's going on here so that we get a better idea. They tell you to draw the free body diagram of the stopper for a person looking eastward from behind you. Now let's think about this. You're at the south end of the merry-go-round. A person, assuming you're facing forward, which most people do on a merry-go-round, you're facing this way to the east as you go. This is the direction that you're going to look, which means someone behind you, which is what they say, that person would be standing over here. What would this person see if he was looking this way, saw you going away from him, and we know that there's a force in the frame of reference of the merry-go-round pushing the shoes outward. By the way, how do you know this? Because you just got up and did it. I hope you're actually doing this. I'm not kidding. You've got to get up and try this. So what would this person see? From a street level view, Let's see, we're going to show this person looking to the east, so that to this person's right, should be that way, we're going to have south, and to this person's left, we're going to have north. If that doesn't make sense, go back and re listen again to what I just said. The person is looking east, so forward is east, which means to his left is north, to his right is south. What direction is straight up if you're standing on the street? It's up. So here's the directions for this person. This is not north, it's up. This is not south, it's down. To the left is north. And to the right is south. This takes a lot of thinking. If you can't see what this is, pause the video and try to figure it out by actually acting out the question. Rewinding the video if you need to. I'm quite serious about this. You've got to be able to visualize problems that go from one frame of reference to another and from one view to another. Now, let's think about what this person is going to see as you hang the rubber stopper in the merry-go-round. You're hanging a rubber stopper and as you know from acting this out with your shoes and shoelaces, the rubber stopper does not hang vertically. In fact, it hangs at an angle that would be outward 
due to the centrifugal force. Outward in this question is south. So actually what you see is this, a rubber stopper that is for some reason hanging toward the south. Now there is a string, and we could say that there is tension in it, and there is gravity, and we could say that that points straight down. There is an outward force that we call the centrifugal, centrifugal force. However, keep in mind, this force is only in the merry-go-round frame of reference. It's not in all in both frames of reference. So don't include this in your Earth frame of reference free body diagram. Finally, a couple of things to point out. Here's the vertical, and there will be some angle theta made between the string and the vertical. And what they're going to ask you in question D over here is what is that angle? You should think back to section 2.5 in the text where we talked about acceleration. We even did a lab on this where linear acceleration caused a rubber stopper to hang at an angle. See what the two formulas come out to, but I'm going to leave it here, folks. Here's your free body diagram. You know how to deal with forces in two dimensions. You're going to use vector components. We're going to take this up in class, but I want to give you a bit of a challenge, which is why I'm going to stop at this point. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. I will see you in class. Good luck with the questions. Bye now.